Welcome to uh, this Mental Wellness uh, Tools for Churches uh, presentation and webinar. I'm really glad to have each of you here. Um, this is a part of a continuing series and initiative uh, that we're um, calling our Mental Wellness Initiative as a conference um, that I will talk about its roots here in just a minute. But I'd like to offer you um, a prayer uh, that comes to us. Uh, I always like to help uh, those that may be uh, in the preaching world and living their uh, lectionary life from week to week, if that's their, their rhythm. And so I offer you a prayer that comes to us from um, Vanderbilt Divinity Schools and Library. They have a, a lectionary series that offers art, prayers, resources, and different readings throughout the lectionary cycle. And so um, that may be a resource that some of you want to use. Would you pray with me? Providing God, you journeyed with Ruth and comforted Hannah. When their lives were burdened by grief, grant us faith to believe you will provide a future where we see none and that bitterness may turn to joy and barrenness may bear life. Amen. So I'd like to um, introduce a couple of things uh, before we get started and uh, get move on to some incredible uh, presenters uh, here today. Um, this effort today comes as a part of our mental wellness initiative that really began early on in the um, COVID pandemic when we started to hear this language of a tsunami of mental health concerns. The idea being that not everything that was coming to surface was really new, uh, but that things are being moved around, that there's so much change and transition and trauma happening that things are now kind of on the surface and exposed and even exacerbated that, that weren't before. We began a design process that really uh, want, uh, gathered some of you here on this call and others to try to listen for ways that we as a conference could focus our efforts um, and work together across uh, different geographies and uh, different sectors, and maybe with different partners to affect an even bigger uh, change. And so some of the top themes that um, our stakeholders around the conference named um, were public policy change needs to happen in order to make mental health uh, resources and funding more available, uh, access to rural care and urban uh, care uh, settings was vital, that there needed to be a, a stronger continuum of care in um, congregations and with congregational partners. So think of referrals and how to help kind of hand off the care of individuals uh, between pastor and, you know, lay leaders and Stephen ministers and those that uh, can help folks through some very uh, difficult settings. Uh, that there was a real need for mental health first aid training across our conference in order to kind of activate uh, people all across North Texas that we have access to not only through our pews, but people that people in our pews know so that we can be a force for healing and wholeness all across North Texas uh, by equipping people with this first aid training. And another um, component that uh, Shirley's working on and, and Dana Coker, who's out in Bonham, have worked on is safety uh, in law enforcement encounters, uh, first aid training to help uh, small departments that may not have the funding for all of the trainings that uh, they may want to be able to de-escalate and uh, make encounters with police less deadly. All those things being said, uh, opening the conversation, destigmatizing uh, the topic of mental health, mental wellness, communicating resources and media about these things seem to be like the key that would unlock everything else. And so that's why we're having this conversation today. And so we, we wondered how might we uh, increase awareness in churches 
that they have a role in mental health and how, I'm, how might we reframe our conception of mental illness, mental wellness, mental health as a part of Wesleyan discipleship, a, a, a discipleship of wholeness of body, mind, and spirit. And how might we even be able to take away the money barrier that is often there uh, for care and wellness? And so a couple of things that we've got brewing um, are uh, we're building out a campaign uh, with the help of our communications department and many people on this call that uh, month by month is gonna be building uh, a set of themed resources around different areas uh, up to May 2022, which is Mental Health Awareness Month. And so November is going to be around holiday stress, which we'll talk about some today. And you'll see these um, resources communicated in newsletters and via our, via our social media from the Center for Missional Outreach and from the conference as a whole. So uh, we'll try to get those uh, pushed out to you as much as possible. And we hope that you and um, uh, People in local churches, pastors will be able to share those through your uh, social media and be able to recommend those resources on to others. Um, so a couple of things that we'd like to make uh, available to you. We have also created a, a portal to talk about this mental wellness initiative here. And we've got the addresses uh, here on your screen. Uh, that talk about where we've been and where we're going, but then also provide a drop-down menu that we're adding to and curating uh, more and more as we walk out toward May 2022 uh, with resources like uh, for those who are on the conference um, insurance plan, how to get in touch with the uh, EAP Appointment Assistance Program, uh, to have free counseling, both for um, that individual and their family members, uh, how to enroll in talk space. You know, for November, we're talking about holiday stress. And so we've got um, a number of resources here uh, from faith and grief, because that's one of the things that often comes up around holidays, uh, support groups, um, podcasts, holiday infographics that you might use from your faith community and personally to share um, an outline for blue Christmas services, if that's something that, um, that you need help with. Um, lists of providers or support groups that you may uh, want to help refer other people to. Uh, housing for those that are in the midst of difficulties. And of course, you know, some of the uh, phone numbers, hotlines um, that we want to make sure they're always in front of us uh, should somebody be in crisis. Um, so if you have resources that you think are really great that we should add and you want to share with others, please send them uh, my way and I will um, put my contact information um, below once we uh, switch speakers. Um, can you uh, see my screen again? the uh, PowerPoint screen in full? Okay. So the other part that we're uh, working on is an experiment with wellness hub churches. And this is an effort uh, with um, Methodist Health um, Faith Community Nursing, the Golden Cross Foundation, and the Center for Integrative Counseling and Psychology, and our Mental Wellness Initiative, and the Mental Health Alliance uh, to experiment with creating uh, three to five site churches uh, that have enough traffic and already connect with their community where we could, in rural, urban, and suburban settings, have a faith community nurse assigned to help train and activate lay people and clergy and staff uh, with first aid training, um, community assessments, individual assessments for congregation members and people coming through. Uh, have a, a covenant site with uh, Brad's group with the Inter Center for Integrative Psychology and Counseling and um, City Square Social Worker or Case Worker uh, to provide some programming and access for folks that are in uh, particularly in the Southern Crescent area of Dallas and, and others in the DFW area. 
Um, so that's some experiments that are ongoing. And uh, I'd like to invite Bud Brown. Bud, are you with us? To just say a word about the mental health alliance that is being built out uh, by First Church and other partners here in the Dallas area. Because I know some of you and your congregations may be really excited about this. Well, Brad, thank, thank you very much. About two years ago, uh, St. Luke uh, Community and First Dallas began talking about putting together an alliance. And this has now culminated in the Mental Wellness Alliance. We have nine churches and it is an alliance of mental wellness ministries. So it's people that are doing fantastic work. We have an education component, a project component, and a community engagement component where we have a uh, um, venture with NAMI North Texas to uh, go out to 10 different community segments that are impacted by mental wellness into 15 counties. It's a huge endeavor, but it all will start with a couple of pilot projects like what you're talking about uh, that you just showed at the churches. So if anybody has interest in that, I would love to talk with you about that. And um, so if they can get my information, uh, that would be fantastic. All right, Bud, as we move on to the next uh, speaker, would you put, are you able to uh, enter your contact information in the chat box? Sure, of course. That would be lovely. All right, I'll do that. Thank you very much for that. So now I'd like for us to transition to uh, talking about some of the, the seasonal uh, resources. You know, we're approaching the holiday season. Uh, we are coming what feels like forever um, in this COVID uh, pandemic. Um, and we know there's a lot of pressure on individuals, parents, um, so many things that are going on in our world that, um, you know, this year, on top of others, we really need to think about what tools and resources we can use to help one another uh, stay well through this this time. So, uh, Shirley, would you introduce yourself and uh, the work that you do and what you recommend uh, for us? Yeah, should I go ahead and bring out my slides to start? Please. Thank you. Here. Are you able to see my slide? You are. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me, Andrew. Um, my name is Shirley Weddle. I am the charter president and co-founder of the Suicide Prevention and Brain Health Rotary E-Club. Prior to that, though, I've been the outreach chairperson at St. Mark's United Methodist Church in Mesquite, where we've actually talked about suicide prevention and brain health since 2015. Um, also involved with, locally with our St. Stephen United Methodist Church, where they've done a lot of work in talking about suicide prevention and have attended Don Anderson's support group for survivors of suicide loss uh, since 2014 when we lost our son Matthew to suicide. And now facilitate a group after having been tutored by Don to be able to do that. Also am an instructor for mental health first aid, a community liaison for the city of Mesquite for our uh, suicide prevention and mental brain health efforts and involved in the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Most importantly, I'm Matthew's mom. So we lost Matthew in 2014 to suicide. And since then, I've really been struggling and been finding along my journey, healing and how to make a difference in Matthew's name to help others. Uh, one thing that I've learned, and that you may share this with those that have lost a child in your congregation, that According to research, your child's stem cells are in the mother's body and their brain and their heart and in their body so that whenever they, they do things in their name, it's like they're continuing on in their child's legacy and making a difference. Our Suicide Prevention and Brain Health Rotary E-Club was started in July officially. We have a diverse membership and not limited by geography because we meet via Zoom on the 
the second and fourth Monday of each month at seven o'clock. Bud is actually a member of our group. We have members, of course, in Dallas County. We have members in Fannin County, Lamar County, over near Cedar Creek Lake, as well as four other states. So we are growing and trying to reach out to people. Um, we're not limited, as I said, by geography, and our purpose or cause is to promote collaboration, advocacy and awareness, understanding, support, education, encouragement, and elimination of stigma surrounding suicide prevention, postvention, brain, mental health, and wellness in all forms, locally and moving out to other communities. We try to identify the needs and collaborate to offer free education and resources to schools, faith organizations, businesses, groups, first responders, other Rotary Clubs, parents, communities, anyone that will listen, so anyone that wants to have some sort of training. We regularly provide updated resource information every month via email, sometimes really long emails that Andrew gets, but lots of information. It's important to understand that suicide is a complex issue, uh, which over 800,000 people are dying by suicide each year, according to the World Health Organization. And people may wonder why people die by suicide. It's due to a combination of internal and external factors and stressors, which generate chemical interactions in the body, which exceed the current coping skills of an individual. There is no single cause. Uh, it's mental health, it's brain health, it's physical health. It's like having a brain attack as opposed to having a diabetes or heart attack. It's influenced by sleep, diet, exercise, stress, pain, feelings of isolation, life events, brain health conditions and development related to age, uh, ages, uh, young age, as well as those in retirement. Again, mental health is brain health, which is physical health. I showed this picture, unfortunately, that um, this is my son, Matthew, at the ballpark at Arlington. And over 44,000 people died by suicide in 2020. And that's fluctuated in the last few years between 44,000 and 48,000. And that's basically about how many people fit in the ballpark at Arlington. You know, I never expected that I would be showing a picture of my son at the ballpark to uh, illustrate how many people die each year by suicide. And even though our numbers have gone down in the last couple of years, the number of people that have died by suicide in the U.S., it doesn't tell the whole story. We've actually had an increase in the number of overdoses, and LGBTQ and minority groups are especially at increased risk of suicide. Veterans are still 1.5 times more likely to die by suicide than non-veteran adults, Rural counties generally have higher rates of suicide than urban areas, usually because of lack of resources and access. Although we're working with the telemedicine and uh, internet access so that hopefully that they'll be able to get more access in those areas. It's estimated that for every one that dies by suicide, that at least 25 others attempt. That's over 1.2 million people in the US. And it's estimated that each suicide affects at least 115 people or more. So you think about your congregations and your communities and your families and how many people are impacted. Suicide is still a leading cause of death, although it moved from number 10 to number 11 in 2020 due to COVID. It's the second leading cause of death in ages 10 through 34, a high risk group. Yes, kiddos age 10 die by suicide. Uh, the largest number of suicides in any single age group is our retirees at age 55 through 64. Survivors of suicide loss are at greater risk of suicide. So it's really important to watch out for them uh, in your congregations and even in your support groups. Those that have had a traumatic sudden loss also are at higher risk. And we've learned that a large majority of people who die by suicide have a mental health condition, but one in four people, one in four of us will have some sort of mental health issue in our lifetime and most do not die by suicide. What are some of the barriers to care and to be able to talk about this? It's the stigma that still exists around mental health and suicide. And it started way back when, many years ago, when perhaps uh, people just didn't understand what was going on in the brain. People were untreated for their mental health conditions. And because they were untreated, they acted in ways that frightened people. And so they then um, created the stigma around it. And sometimes there is greed involved also, by the way. Sometimes people wanted to seize others' property. But through the years, all this information has been propagated and been passed down from generation to generation. It's only now when we can share information, true science information, that I think that we can make a difference. There's a lack of training. Even medical doctors don't get much training in suicide prevention. Law enforcement, the general public, there's a lot of issues still for cost of care. Uh, for insurance coverage and just general financial coverage for counseling. 
And then also there's not enough mental health professionals, especially culturally competent and culturally sensitive ones to meet the needs. In a recent 2022 Mental Health America report, Texas was next to last among all states in the District of Columbia in having mental health professionals available per capita to take care of its citizens. So what is it that we can do together? How we can collaborate and work together? We focus on facts and science instead of fear and misinformation. I think the key to get rid of stigma is to understand that mental health is brain health, is physical health. It's physical health. We talk about mental health and suicide openly as we would any other health topic with friends and family at work and where we worship. We promote awareness and education. We talk about what we learn and we practice it. We learn how to recognize risk factors and warning signs and how to address them so that we know what to do once we recognize them. It's, it's like if you know that somebody's having a heart attack but you don't know CPR, you're kind of in that, that gray area. So we need to understand how to help someone who's having a brain attack know how to find and access resources. It's important to listen non-judgmentally and offer support for those that struggle and to address the misinformation, get rid of the myths about suicide. One really a popular one is that talking about suicide will lead someone to die by suicide and that is false. Actually talking about suicide opens up the conversation and lets them know that someone cares and they can talk about it. We need to get rid of the word committed suicide from our vocabulary. We need to say died by suicide instead or ended their life by suicide because that negative connotation associated with committed in a crime is very hurtful and it also increases the stigma. We need to understand and focus on self-care, mental wellness, and protective factors, which is really important that the church can really offer to its congregation and its leadership. In our Rotary Club, as I mentioned, we try to offer lots of free resources and training. We have multiple versions of the Let's Talk Suicide Prevention and Brain Health presentation, which is about anywhere from 30 minutes to 45 minutes. The Talk Saves Lives PowerPoint presentations from the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. The mental health first aid courses that Andrew mentioned earlier. Actually, one of our members is an outreach person from the North Texas Behavioral Health Authority, and she has funding to offer mental health first aid as often as we want to, to for adults working with youth and for adults working with adults. And some of you have already been to one, a recent one. We have another one coming up on November 6th, Youth Mental Health First Day. It's virtual on a Saturday and we welcome you to sign up for that. And if you have at least five people in your congregation or in your group that would like to class, we can schedule class for five people. It can be virtual or in person. We also have gatekeeper training. We ask for training as well as QPR uh, offered by members of our group. We also have presentations related to veteran um, issues such as moral injury. For younger children, we have a wonderful program called Gizmo's Possum Guide to Mental Health. And it's even for elementary students, which you can also use with families. Uh, there's Soul Shop for youth and adults. There is a Christian-based uh, program that a, number, that a couple of us in our group are able to present. And then the granddaddy or gold standard of uh, intervention skills training, assist training, uh, applied suicide intervention skills training. That is the one thing that we don't have grant funding for. So we're seeking assistance in being able to provide that funding uh, and provide those classes. We're looking at doing that sometime in the spring. There's a number of additional resources that I have here, which I'll make available to Andrew so that he can share them. As I mentioned earlier, we send out our monthly email with lots of different opportunities. Uh, we also have classes now in conjunction with the Mesquite ISD Community Education Department, where you can sign up for mental health first aid classes about bullying and things like that. We have our Christian survivors of suicide loss group support groups, which uh, Dawn leads at Lovers Lane United Methodist Church on the first Thursday. I lead on the third Tuesday via Zoom, and uh, Terry uh, Hartman leads at First UMC. Uh, Richardson in person on the second Tuesday. We have additional support groups through the Faith and Grief group. Uh, again, one of the members of our Suicide and Prevention and Brain Health Rotary E Club. We have the Out of the Darkness Walk coming up on Saturday, uh, as well as the Survivor Day on November 20th. And I'll be glad to provide additional information about that. Here in the city of Mesquite, we offer free mental health counseling to any resident in Mesquite. And you can access information through the City of Mesquite Mental Health Initiative. We also have a number of resources listed there and we update those regularly. We have bilingual counseling available through the Multicultural Recovery Center 
in Mesquite. They also have locations in Dallas and in Irving. The Mustard Seed Generation provides mental health services for Korean American uh, faith communities. Cohen MetroCare provides services for uh, veterans and their families. Uh, information is also here for the VA North Texas for their mental health and suicide prevention group. We have resources available free from the UT Dallas Center for Brain Health. The Brain Health Project is a great program that you can sign up for ages 18 through 100 and whatever. So uh, it's really helpful in learning about your brain, doing your brain health assessment and teaching you how to work out your brain. Uh, Halliburton Foundation, uh, again, one of our members, uh, has lots of resources for youth and actually has a Health for Texas resource line to help you find resources. The Amen Clinics have now opened in Irving and they have resources. NAMI, which Bud mentioned earlier, the National Alliance of Mental Illness has multiple resources. And the Veteran Resource Center, stop1.info, has great recordings and trainings available. So these are just a few of the resources that we offer for free. And in case you don't have it, and this is something that we started doing uh, and putting in our bulletins, is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline number. Uh, you want to have that, and for veterans, you can press one to go directly to a line where you have veteran support. It's available also if you feel more comfortable in speaking Spanish or for hearing challenge folks. And of course, we have the text line. Uh, we'll be doing some additional presentations from our um, e-club uh, soon about those people that are retirees and are at greater risk. And so once we have that, I'll provide some additional information for your retirees and how to support them. And here's my contact information. So if you'd like to contact me, it's my personal email, my cell phone. Now, if you uh, call me on my cell phone, you might need to text or leave a message first. I'm very reluctant to answer numbers that I don't recognize because I usually get calls from uh, people wanting to sell me something. But uh, then of course, my public facing email is the swbrainhealth at gmail.com. Thank you much. Thank you, Shirley. Um... Shirley is a wealth of information, as you can tell. And so, um, you know, I encourage anyone who's interested to sign up for that eRotary Club because it is a, just a, a continual development of resources that we can use in our, in our various settings. April, are you where you can uh, share with us the resources that you've found helpful in this season? Well, thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm April Bristow, Associate Pastor at First United Methodist Church Richardson. I'm Director of Caring Ministries and a, um, also instructor for Course of Study where I teach congregational care. I have done some additional um, research in the whole topic of grief as I have authored a grief recovery class or a divorce recovery class. And actually right now our church is revising our grief recovery class. And so I have dived in pretty deeply to this topic of grief. And so, uh, and also want, and very much a mental health advocate. And so I just wanna share, so I will just go ahead and let you know that this is a work in progress. And so, um, I am just pulling together some ideas for a holiday survival kit for folks to find peace in the midst of grief as they are journeying, specifically as we are in this season now, um, this last part of the year. So that usually the time between um, the end of October, November through the beginning of the year, uh, folks suffer with seasonal affective disorder. And so what can we as the church do to help people that are struggling and having a hard time during this season? And so one of the things that um, I have done was just outline four basic things that the church can do. And these are intentional faith build strategies and suggestions for us to engage in ministry during this time. The first is to just, and, and I say just, that word just is um, sometimes a slight, but also a very small, but also a very powerful word. It is important for us to acknowledge these feelings that we have during this season. Um, I just like to say that our emotions 
are a way that God has fearfully and wonderfully made us. And so for us to embrace how God has fearfully and wonderfully made us and the way we move through life is important. So uh, Shirley talked about those internal and external factors that impact our, our experience as we go through life. It is very important for us to get real when we are having a difficult time to go ahead and say that and to not equate our faith as we get a pass from experiencing this. People of faith have struggles. People of faith have difficulties. And we often think that the Christian thing to do, and I put that in air quotes because it is not necessarily so, is to just focus on the positive and be positive and um, while that is, yes, a, an element of our faith, also being real is an element of our faith as well. And so some of the toxic positivity that we, that we point people to, I think is not helpful. So, um, and, and so I, I want all of us to get very comfortable with acknowledging the difficult times that we have and not necessarily trying to fix it, um, allowing uh, allowing the community really for it to be a whole life and also a whole community support. And so for us to have a community support, um, it is important for us to get the help that we need. Well, what does that mean? I think getting the help that we need means a number of different things. And so it is important for us to have some agency in um, in, in, in where we are and knowing that God has give, gifted us tools and for us to know what those tools are and begin to use those tools. And, and it is important as we, get in, as we try to get the support we need to build our support base. And so I, uh, as a pastor, am very quick to say um, that People need a therapist as they are really all clergy need a therapist. And, and during this time in this season in life, all of us need a therapist because all of us are going through something that needs the help of our therapist to help us um, adjust, relate, and find positive strategies for healthy living. And I like to remind people that this is really a theological move. It is us building the body of Christ and allowing the gifts that God has given other people to help us as we are on our journey. And so it is, it is literally a, a, a whole community perspective because God has gifted people with knowledge, experience, education to help us as we journey through. And so um, it is important for us to lean on that and help to develop our theology and our understanding of who we are, because quite honestly, uh, a lot of our existence is uh, really individual. And, and, and then on top of the individuality becomes, comes the isolation and only this. Well, those things are a recipe for having a difficult time going through life. And so it, it is important for us to build the, the, the support that we need. Um, and so reaching out to therapists and uh, I wanna encourage Stephen Ministry as another great option. And Stephen Ministry are trained leaders that help journey, that journey with people and help people that are going through difficult time with listening support, um, and, and that is very important to have someone to listen to us. We all need a vessel so that we can share um, our story. And so Stephen ministers are trained to listen to your story, journey with you, and a very important element to pray with you as well. And so it is important for us to build our support base and get the 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 help that we need and encourage our members to get the help that they need as well. Another important intentional faith-filled strategy is to get real. Um, 
I just finished teaching our Help for Hurting Hearts grief recovery class. And one of the things that we talked about is how do we deal with this? This is a group of people that have already said, I'm having a hard time. I've had a difficult loss in my life. I'm having a hard time. And now as we are approaching the holiday season, what can I do to get through this season? And so um, one of the things that we start off encouraging them to do is to get real with what you can and cannot do. And so, so often we fall prey to, because we've always done this before, because that is our ritual, that is our habit. And, and we don't really assess whether those things that we do really serve us at this time and at this stage. Um, is it possible to, to do all of this now? Do we have the energy to do all of, you know, if you're one of those people that do all of the cooking during the holiday season, do you even have the energy for all of that? And, um, you know, most of us can muster up and try to do everything and, and we will run ourselves ragged and then totally, <laughs> totally get ourselves even more out of kilter. And so, taking an honest assessment for what you can comfortably handle, uh, understanding what is important to you. If this, this season is a great season to do some reflection of, you know what, that used to be important to me. And I think this is important to me now. And so those things that we used to do that used to be important to us, it's okay to begin to break those ties of those rituals that we used to do. But so many of us are afraid to do that and we don't risk making the change. And some people are quite the opposite, just blow everything, you know, blow everything away and say, you know what, this year is different. I'm not doing any of that. And in that, it is important to, to notice what is really important to you. And then based on where you are, um, make a plan for how you are going to get through the season. And not only make a plan, but find a, an accountability partner that will journey with you to help you along the way. And so one of the things that we're doing at First Richardson is pairing, uh, we have a Stephen ministry program and we have some Stephen ministers that are unassigned. And so one of the things that we're doing during this season is having a very intentional time um, from the middle of November to after the beginning of January, where we're assigning Stephen ministers to people that are having a hard time during the season so that they can be that prayer support, that accountability support, and encouragement support, and just an overall support so that uh, people can feel connected, feel loved, and valued as they go through this season. And the last thing that I want to talk about is um, it just something simple. As people of faith, we need to get back to the basics of our faith. And so I have, um, again and again, just looked at the whole season of Advent, Advent and the Advent focus. And my goodness, uh, I think this will help us a lot as we are working with people who are journeying through a difficult time to point them back to the real meaning of the Advent season, the preparation for Christmas, the focusing each week as we light the candle on hope. What is hope in my life? Peace. What is that shalom, that multi-dimensional, um, that that multi-dimensional life focus of shalom, where it is not just peace making with one another. It is a whole life response to our lives. Um, so looking for that peace, that shalom, the joy, the love, and then Christ. Um, all of these principles, I think, are so important to helping us as we navigate the difficult time, the, navigate a difficult time and season as we journey through Advent. And so as we are encouraging people to reconnect to the basis of our faith, 
and, um, and focusing on what the real meaning of Christmas is, this preparation for the, the coming of Christ. It's also important to um, maybe look at some new spiritual practices. So what are some things that you can do during this season to be intentional, to, to connect with God in a more meaningful, in a deeper way? And so Bible, pray, Bible study, prayer, those are the great kind of go-to things. But I want us to think outside of the, this, the spiritual practice box to think about new things, new ways that you can connect with, the, with, with your faith, the, the tenets of our faith, reconnect with God, ourselves, and with each other. Thank you so much, April. Um, really appreciate this emphasis on um, getting back to basics and getting real. And I, and I wonder, um, um, Kim, if you would be able to, to go next. Uh, of course. Would you introduce yourself? And in, you've got a, a recent book that is out and okay. some workshops coming up that I think uh, really speak to the, the realness that we I need to get do. to. In this I'm trying. I, here we go. Can you all see my screen? Okay. My name is Kim Myers, and I am a pastor at St. Andrew and I Methodist Church. And um, my focus is on family ministry. And I currently um, just published a book called Parenting with Perspective. Um, and I'm doing workshops. I'd love to come to your church. But for today, I wrote um, a little bit of a April, like it's like we planned together, actually. It's kind of funny. Um, of what you can do when it comes to the holidays, when it comes to family. Um, I think um, one thing um, about my book that I think is a little bit different, A, it's just real. Like it talks about how you don't like your kids all the time. It talks about how you mess up. It has um, um, pieces in it than that. But what it starts with is you as the parent. So the adult um, who is helping to raise the children. Um, I think when it comes to the holidays, there's a lot of expectations that come around a lot of people, right? So um, I am married to my husband. He has his family, which is also part of four brothers, which I then have my family and I have a sister. So managing expectations about where you're going, where you're not going, where you're gonna stay, um, is important to name that before Thanksgiving Day or Christmas Day, um, but managing those expectations both for yourself and also for your children, right? Um, when we go to different families' homes, there's different rhythms of each family home. So setting your children up for that success of, okay, we're going to this house. At this house, you know, the grandparents kind of sit in their chair and do this. At this house, the grandparents are going to be very, you know, just acclimating people for what to expect. I don't care what age. I have teenagers. I prep my children before we go to my sister's house. Don't forget, your nephews love you, look up to you, and they're younger, and they're going to ask a lot of questions. Be ready for that. Um, I think that expectations for both you as an adult and for your children, no matter what age, is fine. At this house, Pop-Pop likes hugs. If you don't want to give Pop-Pop a hug, give them an alternative for a handshake or, you know, um, a fist bump. Setting these things where you know where things can go down. I also say plan for the meltdown. If you have younger children, this time of, of year is full of um, class parties, um, right? Halloween is on a Sunday night, which means Monday morning is just, we just need to all get on our knees and play, pray for all the educators for this Monday morning. Um, but plan for the meltdowns. How are you going to handle them? Are you going to take them outside? Are you, just have it in your mind because at some point from October through December, it's going to happen. There's extra food, there's extra candy, there's less naps. Just plan for that. 
And also when within that, plan for quiet time. In the craziness of the holidays, plan for a food, family movie night where you don't do anything. You order a pizza, you sit on the couch and you just rest. Um, plan for just something simple because there isn't very much of that. As April said, if you're the person who likes to cook all the meals, do you actually have time to cook all the meals? I don't enjoy cooking the meals. So guess what? I can order a pizza and everybody's happy. I have a house of teenage boys. So I actually order like four pizzas because that's just my life right now. But plan for that just kind of respite time. And then naming what's important for your family. Each family has different rhythms and needs and wants. And that's gonna change as your family changes. For example, it was important for me when we had young children to be at our home on Christmas morning. I named that expectation to all of our family. I opened our doors and said, we're gonna be in pajamas. I have some casseroles on the counter, come on by, but we ain't leaving, right? And honestly, I've respected that with my sister now that she has the little ones. We go to her house because she don't wanna leave with all the toys, right? My kids are still in bed, it's fine. We just roll on up in pajamas. Um, just naming what's important to our family. We used to do a happy birthday Jesus cake. That was something that we made time to do as a family. Um, we don't do that so much anymore. Um, now that our rhythm has changed and I'm quite busy on Christmas Eve, our new family norm is going to a Chinese buffet when I have an hour off from, I'm not in a worship service. It's become our thing. We love it right? But it's changed as the rhythm changes. I'm sure now as we're approaching the empty nester phase, ah, um, that rhythm will change too. But just naming what's important at the time. And then I also think it's important to name what can you let go of. You don't have to do all the things and be at all the things. It's okay to say no. It's hard for us to say no, especially this time of year and especially with the family expectations that come with things. But I used to host Christmas Eve. I ain't hosting Christmas Eve anymore. And it's okay. Everybody still loves me fully for who I am. Um, I think these things sound very simple. Um, but if you actually do these and, and set these expectations for yourself, in your family, I feel like the whole journey of the holidays can um, go a little bit easier, go a little, a little quieter. And then as April talked about faith, um, again, this has changed as we have grown as a family. Um, reading the Christmas story um, in Luke was something that we still do every Christmas Eve, right? It's just become a rhythm of our family. Um, but what is important, the other thing that we started doing was just lighting a candle for a minute a day. Um, sometimes it lasted 10 seconds, sometimes it lasted the full minute, but finding those times to connect with your faith during Advent, um, I mean, that's what it's for, right? To prepare your hearts and your minds and teaching your children um, and your family how to do that in intentional, easy ways, light a candle, talk about something that was good that day. Light a candle, talk about something you're struggling with. Just naming that you're here and you're joining this together. Read a portion of um, the Christmas story every day. Whatever it is that can be simple and intentional. I mean, we used to do it with a Lego calendar, right? We'd sit around, open the Lego advent calendar, which was completely secular. But within that moment, we would talk about also our faith story and they were building Legos, right? You just gotta find what works for you. So um, I think um, ultimately that's what I would just wanted to share with y'all that gain that perspective, right? And I am 100% available. Um, well, not 100%. I will say no at times because it's healthy. Um, but to um, come to your church and lead parenting workshops um, to just help parents find this respite and time to breathe. I threw my email address and my website um, in the comments. If you have any questions, I'm here. Thank you so much, Kim.
Mm -hmm. uh, Brad, what is on your mind as you, um, uh, you know, lead the Center for Integrative Psychology and Counseling and um, in this season, like, what are you encountering? What, what do you um, kind of commend to others? I know you uh, offer a lot of interviews for um, you know, local news channels and others to help um, individuals and families kind of think through how to prepare for different situations. Um, what, what would you recommend for us as we go about this work in the season? Sure, thank you. Um, I do believe that April and Kim really beautifully encapsulated many different issues that people face at holidays. As they were sharing, what I was thinking about was how what they're discussing, uh, uh, the, the discussion about suicide and, and education, all of that is a microcosm for what should and does and can happen throughout the year. And so that, that means one education. So um, each, uh, e each of those who've already spoken uh, talked about ways that we educate, we raise awareness. Uh, April mentioned validation, uh, validation that things aren't always great. Um, and so I think that during this time, uh, we are aware of what's already been mentioned and just taking in the complexity of grief right now. We're facing a season of grief when we haven't been able to, uh, when we haven't been able to grieve in the ways that we're used to. Uh, so, um, so, so that would be one uh, a note. The second part of what has already been mentioned that is so key throughout the year is then prevention. So stepping in a little bit more with opportunities for teaching of skills. Uh, so it's one thing to say and validate this season may be difficult. That next step is offering practical tips for what Kim is, is mentioning. And, and that, that is more along the lines of prevention. With that information, we can prevent uh, there being um, unrealistic expectations on kids' behavior, which then takes away the opportunity for good, solid, quality time. And then the, the third phase, and I think this is key and a part of what this whole mental health initiative Andrew, that you have been uh, so uh, persistent with and done such a great job with, and it, it's evolving, and I, I see that fruit of your work, um, is intervention. So um, when we talk about the crisis hotlines, when we talk about, as April mentioned, Stevens ministers, uh, when we talk about uh, key uh, the keys to really making referral information as available as possible so that people know that counseling is available. Um, so intervention um, needs to happen uh, when issues have progressed, uh, just as we destigmatize the idea of uh, mental health as a health issue, we also need to destigmatize uh, mental uh, health care. So making sure people know that it's okay to uh, get counseling. And I definitely agree uh, with what April said about ministers. Church leaders are um, entrusted with the care of souls and uh, congregations, parishioners project a lot onto ministers. Uh, ministers are having to be vulnerable and listening to others' vulnerabilities and we have our own vulnerabilities. And so that's a lot. So um, that, that encouragement and, and one way to encourage that is, is through um, referral. Uh, by the way, Don from Lover's Lane UMC on the call, um, I, I came up, uh, maybe it's a new term. She is an active referrer. Um, so I will see her name come up at the center often, uh, people calling and saying, Don recommended I call. Um, um, same goes, uh, obviously, with April and, and Kim, uh, but just noting Don's commitment to mental health, and I've always been impressed by that. So um, just, just some other anecdotes. Uh, we are very busy. Um, there is a lot of demand. Um, I'm talking to April about getting back into our office at First UMC Richardson. 
Uh, we've been able to start at some churches. We've been able to be in person at Christ UMC, providing counseling at First UMC Waxahachie. Um, it's just a matter of getting our therapists in there. Really, what's now that they're hybrid schedules where people still want telecounseling, and it is convenient, and it's another location for us now. Um, it is another way for making uh, counseling accessible. Um, but what we are working on doing, um, and it's calls like this that are very important to us, um, that is working to be a support, uh, working to provide information. I'm just in the chat. Um, Andrew, would you do me a favor? I'm working off of my phone. Uh, do you mind emailing my email or commenting in the chat box with my email address? That would be awesome. Sorry to make you do that. Uh, but it'll just make it easier and less painful for everybody to be able to see me uh, doing that. So um, I'm used to using my phone. So bottom line, um, what I have heard uh, being very intentional about validating, and that is about raising awareness, uh, but then going that next step and offering opportunities for discussion, for learning, for learning of skills, and then finally being ready and being uh, proactive about opportunities for more in-depth intervention. Um, what, one other note that I've been aware of in work with churches would be really being in tune uh, with all of the different types of families, all of the different stages of family life. So sometimes there's subtle things that, that we might do. We might say uh, there's an adult uh, couples a uh, uh, Christmas party when there are uh, single uh, adults um, who have been in the church who are perhaps are divorced now and that's still a part of their community um, being in tune with how things are scheduled so that uh, people are able to attend uh, so that's just one final encouragement is really being in tune uh, with people's different ages stages lives uh, where their families are uh, to be as inclusive as possible in different types of Christmas experiences. Um, so uh, take what y'all have already talked about, that ongoing, um, consistent um, um, uh, provision and menu of opportunities on each of those stages. Just one more example, Plymouth Park UMC contacted me and they have planned out uh, a, a series and already have the date set, already have everything planned for the spring. Um, so we're looking forward to being a part of that. Uh, Bud, definitely want to, to speak with you. We've done some work with St. Luke and of course I've done some work with First uh, Dallas. I uh, really am excited about what you're doing and want to talk more about that. So always fun to be with this group of awesome people. So thank you for having me. Well, I want to thank each of you for being a part of this conversation and sharing uh, from your perspective and experience kind of what you would commend for others in this season and um, for your continued partnership as we, you know, think about mental wellness and discipleship and how we can together make a, a bigger impact across our conference and in North Texas. Um, this uh, session will be recorded and um, I will post uh, that uh, via our social media as well as email that to all of you who signed up today. Um, and uh, I'm always encouraging, if you have resources that you would like to add uh, to our uh, resource list, would love to have your input on that uh, as we go about collecting them. Uh, and I'm very thankful for your work. And that concludes our call. <laughs>